this is a Stories to be Told podcast. I chose to reflect on the 21st of October for two reasons. Firstly, in honour of my father's birthday, and secondly, it is the same date that we in Britain remember one of the greatest victories in our maritime history, the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805. Obviously, I called my father later on that day to wish him many happy returns, but the focus of this podcast will be to contemplate issues around the latter. In my podcast episode, The Victory Behind Horatio Nelson, I discuss, through my own perspective, how the British Navy had a diverse profile of men, and sometimes women, who came from a range of ethnicities and nationalities. Although many of these figures have not been widely written about or referred to in British history, they were certainly an integral part of Nelson's crew and therefore central to Britain's victory over France and Spain. Now that in more recent times there is a growing culture toward the acknowledgement of the presence and contribution of African and other ethnic groups in British history, is it time to view the 21st of October as a day within Black History Month that could also acknowledge this? We know that the 21st of October is traditionally called Trafalgar Day, but if we could name that day something else, what could we call it? Trafalgar Memorial Day? Or possibly George Ryan Remembrance Day? In honour of the African portrayed in the iron cast on the blinth of Nelson's column in Trafalgar Square. Although it is said that this man could possibly be identified as George Ryan, he could have been any of the nine West Indians recorded on Nelson's ship HMS Victory. Could he have been John Francois or Jonathan Hardy? It is anybody's guess. Nevertheless, George Ryan has become an embodiment of the contribution of Africans who fought for the Royal Navy, not just at Trafalgar, but throughout the entire Napoleonic Wars, 1803 to 1815. This is an example of how the depiction of Africans and those of other ethnic backgrounds in Britain's history presents a twofold problem. The need to ensure an accurate representation of Africans, while also establishing individual identity. In the present day, how are we addressing this twofold problem with our own learning journeys as well as within our formal curriculum in schools? As I look back over my career as a primary school teacher, I can certainly say that we have made some progress toward creating a history curriculum for our primary schools that, at the very least, recognises the need for more inclusive and diverse content to reflect the representation of identities of people from from African and other ethnicities. In my own borough of Hackney in London, a working party of teachers from diverse backgrounds have put together a diverse curriculum which clearly identifies individuals who were Africans or of African descent, placing them firmly within the chronology of British history. Education authorities in Wales have made it mandatory to teach black history in their schools, while most schools and education authorities throughout England have or are in the process of reviewing their curriculum to reflect diversity and representation in some way. In my own school setting, we have certainly made a start by including a diverse range of writers to link with topic work, enhance our book corners and diversify our author-focused texts for each term. Our pupils will read and study the works of Atinuke in the nursery, Zainib Milan, 
for our eight to nine year olds and I'm very proud to say John Agard for our 10 to 11 year olds. We also made the decision to review our icons for Black History Month this year and focus on British figures rather than their obvious American counterparts. However, even in my position as a key decision maker in my own workplace, I still contemplate how much further we have to go in acknowledging African identity as well as African contributions to British history as a school, local authority and nationally. But is it always about the need for others to acknowledge our place in society? Or do we need to acknowledge that we have always had a seat at the table? It is common for African women to be labelled as aggressive, loud or angry. But these are not identities. And neither should or do African women and those of African origin accept them as such. These are lazy terms used by those who cannot recognise or accept strength, power and dignity as positive qualities in those who do not either look like them or represent them. Identity holds a lot of power and a lot of collateral. I wrote a post on my personal Facebook page about the public and media criticism toward the revelations by Simone Biles and Naomi Osaka of their need to put their own mental health first and step away from the pressures of being in the limelight and the weight of their own expectations as well as the expectations of others. It is as if it is expected that we as Africans should be able to put up with the pain and tolerate issues that others are not expected to. Do we automatically accept struggle and adversity as an integral part to our identity? And if it is not present, then are we not being acknowledged? Just because Simone and Naomi stepped away from the limelight and the pressure, does it mean that they lose their seat? Going back to 1805, it has always been easier to celebrate and acknowledge the collective contributions of Nelson's diverse crew rather than individual achievement. And this was due to the fact that it was difficult to identify in most cases who these Africans and sailors of other ethnicities actually were. And why was this? The problem was the inconsistent record-keeping of logbooks on board many of the ships. The Royal Navy did not differentiate between Africans and Indians, often referring to them as black or coloured. On the ship which Nelson directly commanded, as many as 22 ethnicities were recorded in its ship logbook, and combined records show that out of the 1,400 non-British crewmen, a third of these were of African or ethnic background. The names of some African seamen have been recorded and their memory lives on. There were at least 10 crewmen from African backgrounds aboard HMS Bellerophon at Trafalgar. One of these was a 24-year-old from Jamaica called Samuel Marlowe. Others also named were John Hackett, a young 22-year-old, and Magnus Booth. Other sources, such as portraits and family records, had to be relied upon as historical sources for identification. However, some of the most reliable sources were parish records, and possibly the most significant was the record of the black pensioners at Greenwich Hospital, which kept a record of retired sailors between 1692 and 1869. These records show the age, date of birth, length of service and service details of the ship's name on which they served, the type of injury sustained as well as the place of residence as well as marital status. 20,000 pensioners were interred at Greenwich Naval Hospital Old Burial Ground and when the hospital closed in 1875, their remains were moved to East Pleasance Park in East Greenwich, with a memorial built on the original burial ground. 
in a look back at how far we have come and how much further we have to go, let's celebrate this day within Black History Month as these places and sources serve as reminders of the identities as well as the collective contributions of Africans who worked at sea. A celebration of their bravery and fortitude, which at a time in British history, not only helped to stave off Napoleon's threat of invasion, but also enabled Britain to become the world's most dominant sea power throughout the course of the following century. If you liked this podcast, then stay on my website or this listening platform and check out my other podcast episodes in relation to this one, The Victory Behind Horatio Nelson and Victorian Revolutionaries, where I explore my perspective around the gradual prominence of individual identity combined with collective achievement of African communities in England and on the other side of the Atlantic and how the work of individuals and events at the end of the 18th and early 19th centuries, at such a pivotal time in history, brought about the formal end of slavery and emancipation. Remember to visit storiestobetold.com. We recently released some new content on our platform and we'll be adding more very soon. You'll also find what I like to call the heart and soul of the Stories to be Told movement, my current stories or poetic narratives, Caribbean Wind, Caribbean Rush, Nights at the Round Table, the Berlin Conference 1884, and Gone with the Wind, Macmillan's Speech for Change. They're available in ebook, Kindle and paperback versions. And as I've said before throughout Black History Month last month, we're working on some more title releases, so they're coming very soon very soon. Feel free to like, follow, share and subscribe to us on social media and as always it's a pleasure and a privilege to share my learning journey with you in this podcast and I encourage you to either begin or continue your own. History is a matter of fact or perspective. Thanks so much for listening and I'll see you on the next page.